Warning, this podcast is about religion and politics, so either it can have naughty words in it, or we can fucking lie. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by HelloFresh, and by the new Christmas song masking service, The Slamma Whamageddon. When this portable pocket-sized device detects as much as a single note from Wham's Last Christmas, as well as 12 other programmable shitty pop songs about the holiday, it emits an electromagnetic burst that knocks out all electronics within a five-mile radius. The slam o wham again. It's their fault it had to come to this, not ours. And now, The Scathing Atheist. This is Sean. And this is Janice. From Colorado. And we did, in fact, evolve. From filthy monkey men. And, and sorry, sorry about, about Lauren Bobert. Bobert. It's December 15th. And it's Cat Herder's Day. How many more does Noah have to adopt before they dedicate it to him by name? Come on. <laughs> no illusions. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Henright. And from Frank Sinatra's New Jersey. Yeah, baby. Ann Arbor, Michigan, and Waycross, Georgia. This is The Scathing Atheist. On this week's episode, Christians get a taste of their own lettuce in medicine. <laughs> we'll talk about the <laughs> literature of... <laughs> Published author Kirk Cameron. Huh. And will Phil Morgan's editing screen the fuck up with all the vulgarity for charity guests we bring tonight? But first, the diatribe. Oh, okay, so if you're into video games, you don't need me to tell you that God of War Ragnarok is fucking awesome. And if you're not into video games, you don't give a shit how awesome it is. But even having acknowledged how little this input is needed, and I'm still going to say it, God of War Ragnarok is fucking awesome. And to be honest, it's not really the kind of game I normally enjoy a lot in that it's really narrative heavy. That, that means that you spend almost as much time watching your game as playing it. And normally that shit drives me nuts, right? I, I want to mash a button, skip the dialogue, and get back to ripping monsters in half with my flame knives or whatever. But the writing in this one, the voice acting, the way that the storytelling ties in with the gameplay really makes the cutscenes the highlight of the experience. And don't worry, I do remember what this show is about, and trust me, I'm getting there. Because this, this whole game franchise revolves around ancient mythology. It started off among the Greek pantheon, but eventually that sort of played itself out, and it, they moved the story into Norse mythology. Same main character, mind you. So, so you now play as a, a Spartan warrior navigating his way through Asgard and shit. And as you may have already surmised based on that description, the writers didn't really feel the need to stick to the historical interpretation of said mythology. They just use familiar characters and elements to craft a new story that gives you that novel but familiar feel that you get with like a, like a well-made prequel or reboot, Right. And that really got me to thinking about what a shame it is that the most familiar of all the ancient world's mythologies is so inaccessible to modern storytellers. I mean, so, so what makes stories like the one in God of War work is that to some degree, you already know these characters. They have established personality traits and rivalries and betrayals that give them a depth that most stories, you know, have to devote a pretty big chunk of their time to setting up. Plus, in most fantasy stories, the writer has to tip their hand every time they introduce a new magical item or spell or something. But, you know, when you're drawing from an existing mythology, something like Thor's hammer or Loki's mask can just show up, you know, mid-story, and, 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 and we know what we're dealing with, right? We're not surprised by them. In other words, the more aspects of the mythology the reader or player or viewer already knows, the more avenues it opens up to the storyteller, which means that the ideal mythology when it comes to storycraft in modern-day America or pretty much anywhere that we have an audience, is Christianity. Now, obviously, using Christian mythology and stories isn't entirely taboo the way it might have been 100 years ago, right? Horror movies often draw on Catholic mythology. Comedies borrow heavily from the ideas of heaven and angels a lot of times. Every third movie we watch on GAM is based on apocalypse mythology. But when a writer is using living mythology, for lack of a better term, they're constrained in ways that the people who made God of War Ragnarok just weren't. You know, like even a, a, a movie as irreverent and wantonly blasphemous as Kevin Smith's dogma still felt the need to like treat Christianity with a certain amount of reverence, 
as Chris Rock's Jesus is just all right with me speech attests. But if we were freed from those shackles, imagine how many new stories we could sculpt out of the Bible's raw materials. I mean, obviously, the first thing I would want is a game where Kratos beats the fuck out of like the Archangel Gabriel and Swordmouth Jesus is a boss fight. But that's obviously just the tip of the storytelling iceberg, right? David and Goliath, Cain and Abel, Samson and Delilah, Adam and Eve. There are literally dozens of ready tropes ready for creative exploitation. Characters whose relationships we'd automatically understand and whose motivations we just automatically know. And not to mention cinematic backdrops like heaven, hell and purgatory. Because see, here's the thing. I know this is going to sound weird to people who aren't familiar with how much more sophisticated video game narratives have gotten in the last 10 or 15 years, but God of War Ragnarok has some remarkably human moments. You know, moments of genuine pathos that hit all the harder because of the, you know, the second person nature of a video game. And when you think about it, it's really remarkable that the very same characters and fictional lands that were touching the hearts of like 13th century Icelandic poets are also touching the hearts of modern day gamers in South Georgia. But the very reason they can be relevant is because they're not reverent. Right? They've got creative license to redeem, betray, or kill off any character they see fit to in service of the larger story. They're allowed to update it because nobody's going to get furious at them for not like treating Heimdall with his due respect. Or I guess almost nobody. The internet is a place where people go to complain about Batman stories that don't line up with canon. So I'm sure somebody's pissed about it. But try making a game where it turns out that Jesus was the bad guy the whole time, right? And compare the size of the protests. And, and I'm not normally one to tell Christians how to use their Bible, but they're fucking it up. The whole point of having a mythology is so that it can act as a touchstone from generation to generation. But when you're inflexible with your stories, you rob them of that potential. For the modern reader, there's no ethical core to most of the Bible's stories. right? There's no moral to be gleaned from Noah's Ark or Jephthah's daughter or Lot's wife. They're valuable in their preserved form in terms of like helping us understand what mattered to people thousands of years ago. But in depriving them of their modernity, you've also deprived them of their humanity. By imbuing them with divine meaning, you've robbed them of all practical meaning. And you've made it so that the living mythologies are the deadest ones of all. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast and bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight are the ghost of Christmas past and present to my ghost of Christmas future, Heath Enright and Eli Bosnick. Fellas, are you ready to, I guess, go harass a rich guy? Yeah, sure. Also, in the remake, I think we have our ending be... Tiny Tim just beating the fuck out of Elon Musk with his crutch. I would enjoy that. <laughs> oh, there you go. Go harass a rich guy. Don't send that death threat. You and Andrew are very confusing this week. Noah. Okay. Very All right. Well, apparently confused. we need That's to bring confusing. Andrew back on the line to draw Eli the chart again. So while we do that, we're going to pause for a word from this week's sponsor. Hello, fresh. Uh, Santa. Well, hello there. Twinkle toes. How can I help you? Did you, um, did you order Chinese food? I did. Oh, boy, is it here? Well, yeah, but it's kind of cold and the delivery fees were really high. <laughs> Tell me about it, Twinkle Toes. But Santa is so busy this time of the year that takeout is the only way for him to eat a hot meal. Well, why don't you just try HelloFresh? What's HelloFresh? With HelloFresh, you get farm-fresh pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. A meal kit delivered all the way to the North Pole? But Santa's trying to save money. You will. HelloFresh is cheaper than grocery shopping and 25% less expensive than takeout, so you can use those savings for holiday gifts or just to treat yourself. Okay, but cooking a meal, that's got to take forever, right? Not at all, Santa. HelloFresh has quick and easy options like 20-minute meals and easy cleanup dishes. Big on flavor and easy on effort, these time-saving solutions mean more time with friends and family around the holidays. It's true. I was a HelloFresh customer even before they became a sponsor. I love the variety and the way they make eating right easy. Heath's still here arguing to be on the nice list? Yeah, he's just waiting on his Uber now. Anyway, where do I sign up, Twinkle Toes? Go to HelloFresh.com slash Scathing18 and use the code Scathing18 for 18 free meals plus free shipping. So I just go to HelloFresh.com slash Scathing18 and use code Scathing18 for 18 free meals plus free shipping? That's right. Uh, so uh, what's the what's, uh, look on that Uber? Uh, it says Kyle's going to be here in 
238 days. Oh, yeah, right. Because North Pole. Because North Pole. Yeah. Right. And now, back to the headlines. In our lead story tonight, a Christian hate group had a consequence, Anna. What are the guys talking about? It's the newest, the greatest Christian freakout. That's right. The bigots got hated right back and they're having a freak out. The Metzger Bar and Butchery in Richmond, Virginia, refused to serve a Christian hate group, citing the official reason of, you're a hate group, no, we're not going to serve you. Yeah. And now the hate group is ugly crying about the injustice of sincerely held anti-bigotry, <laughs> which makes me so very happy. Oh, well, how about you guys cry about it over a, over a cheese plate with Sarah Huckabee? Oh, wait. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm sorry. Are the people who spent the last infinity trying to deny people life-saving health care and wedding cakes unable to get a corner booth at the chippy? Will cancel culture? No, no. And <laughs> <laughs> so this whole thing started when the Family Foundation planned a reception, and booked a party of 20 people at Metzger Bar. You know what? Let me start over. It all started when a series of liars wrote the Bible and said it was the word of God, the divine word of the God of the universe. And then, okay, uh, centuries of persecution, war, death, crusades, Holocaust, uh, Donald Trump, Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, Amy Coney Barrett, should have voted for Hillary Clinton. And now we have <laughs> tax-exempt charities like the Family Foundation, whose major function is fighting against the civil rights of the LGBTQ community and forcing people to give birth against their will. Well, given all that, the owners of Metzger Bar did the perfect thing. They handled this beautifully. They took the booking. They waited several weeks until right before the event. And then they called the bigots and said, yeah, we don't serve your kind here. The bigot kind. <laughs> your base. You're canceled. I still prefer Eli's suggestion where he's their waiter and he just comes out wearing increasingly risque outfits until they leave voluntarily and never actually give them food. But but this is still pretty good. Well, this we can work in that one too. I like yeah. that. Yeah. Honestly, I, I blame myself. I shouldn't have opened with the final outfit I wanted to wear in my proposal. It scared them off. I should have done the <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Silly. So here's the official explanation from Metzger Bar on Instagram. They said, quote, recently we refused service to a group that had booked an event with us after we found out, it was a group of donors to a political organization that seeks to deprive women and LGBTQ plus persons of their basic human rights in Virginia. We have always refused service to anyone for making our staff uncomfortable or unsafe. Many of our staff are women and or members of the LGBTQ plus community. All of our staff are people with rights who deserve dignity and a safe work environment. We respect our staff's established rights as humans and strive to create a work environment where they can do their jobs with dignity, comfort, and safety. End quote. Just so, so reasonable. And also, by the way, if you listen closely to the uh, the subtext of that, you'll you'll hear it. Do you, do you guys hear? Just, fuck your face. It says fuck your face yeah. in this face. It does. It does. I mean, I still prefer Heath's suggestion where they responded by literally fucking their faces, but this is still pretty good. This is also yeah. good. You, well, you know, you have to position the cloche just right over the plate with the hole in it. It's possible, but it's, all, it's a yeah. real hassle. I get yeah, yeah. it. No, it's just a whole thing. And <laughs> here's the response we got from Victoria Cobb, the president of the hate group. She'll be comparing herself to the civil rights activists of the 50s and 60s. Oh, good. So there you know. it is. There yeah. it is. So see if you can tease out any flaws in the logic as, as I'm going through the quote here. She said, we've been canceled. Welcome to the 21st century where people who consider themselves progressives attempt to recreate an environment when people were denied food service due to their race. Well, at least she recognizes that the problem is that it's the 21st century. <laughs> <laughs> Continuing. Thankfully, in 1960, 34 brave Virginia Union University students held a peaceful lunch counter sit-in to demand service at a whites-only counter. Welcome to the double standard of the left, where some believe Jack Phillips must be forced to create a wedding cake as part of the celebration of a same-sex ceremony but any business should be able to deny basic goods and services to those who hold biblical values around marriage. End quote. I just, yes. I mean, the, the, the answer to your thing. Yes, that's it. Yep. 
She does know. Yes. Can she hear what she's saying? She cannot. <laughs> Maybe the mouth she's like is one of those sleep talking things. No, just the, <laughs> it, their vestigial ears. They're just decorative. Just, uh, yeah, that makes sense. So bottom line, people who believe in the words of the Bible make me feel unsafe. And every reasonable person should be feeling the same way. And if these bigots are doing any sort of like outward behavior beyond the thinking that stuff, like actively participating in a hate group, for example, we need to sincerely hold that they're not allowed anywhere because I feel unsafe if they go anywhere. Even if honestly, OK, I said, you know, thinking about it's OK. No, even if they're just inwardly thinking about the Bible being accurate, I'd like to ban them <laughs> from everywhere for that thought crime. Like I know the thought crime we're not supposed to have thought crimes i want the one this should be we should have one <laughs> that's the thought crime you believe the bible's the real thing that's real reality no that's a crime <laughs> and in by you love to see it news podcast listener in this age of monsters it can be easy to lose heart it can be easy to look at the sunset and wish for the sun to never rise again on a world so full of darkness and cruelty but it's always darkest before the dawn. No, it's not. That expression is stupid. And there's a new hero, nay, group of heroes for us to celebrate this week. I'm talking, of course, about the Stanford Marching Band, which, in order to mock their opponents at Brigham Young University this week, held a fake gay wedding during halftime, <laughs> complete with the words of the Mormon marriage rite. <gasps> Oh, that's beautiful. All the Mormon fans had to go home and stick something in their ass to check and see if they're gay now. It's just, I like, oh, it's so I'm sorry. I don't make the rules of Mormonism. Those are, Those are the rules. rules. Those are the rules. So here's what you do. You just lower yourself onto a penis and then you have your friends jump on the bed next to you. Technically, that's allowed as the test. You're just, that's for science. You're doing it for science. Now, I should point out that this is not the first time Stanford's marching band has gotten itself into hot water with its BYU audience. When they played Brigham Young University in 2004 for their sketch about their opponents, they mocked polygamy and featured five extra wives wearing veil, <laughs> which is also very, very funny. Great work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this time, the sketch titled Gay Chicken hilarious lampooned two homophobic BYU students leaning further and further into their homophobia until they're married in an official Mormon ceremony. <laughs> so, all right. Though I might be in the minority here. I mean, I might, but I would much rather watch the Stanford marching band do sketches about how stupid Mormonism is than Rihanna, right, for the Super Bowl halftime show? Absolutely. So, Fox Sports, if you're listening, just add my vote to whatever tally you're keeping. Okay, I get what you're saying. I feel like it can be both, though. I like Riri. Get Rihanna doing a sketch and her show. Sure, okay. Yeah, yeah. all right. Yeah, She's yeah. delightsome. So, like, halfway there for the oh, Mormon Jesus thing. Christ. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm sad to say that this story does not have a happy ending. The Stanford Athletic Department, cowards, apologized for the sketch because they're cowards. But Boo. it does give me a chance to accentuate a point I feel we don't make often enough on this show. Because while it's important to keep in mind the harm jokes might do, it's also equally important to know that just because someone is hurt by something doesn't mean you owe them an apology. Especially when the thing that hurt their feelings was the truth. Mm. Yeah. Fuck your face is how I say that. Eli said it really nicely. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. And in pedophile clerk news tonight. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I know this will come as a shock to a lot of people, but we have yet more evidence this week that the Catholic Church is really bad at catching the Catholic Church committing crimes <laughs> and not, I should emphasize, because of how few crimes they commit. Mm -mm. But yeah. The attorney hired to oversee abuse complaints for the Diocese of Montreal issued a report this week detailing all the various ways in which the very people who appointed her are now obstructing those efforts. These ways include but are not limited to disappearing documents, leaking confidential complaint and information, postponing follow up actions and intimidating the diocese and employees that help her out. OK, yeah, it feels like that's not particularly surprising. She's like, here's my report. My boss hired me to investigate himself, uh, and I found exactly what you'd expect. I don't know, understand <laughs> right. my job. Yeah. You can't report me to HR. I hired HR. What do you mean that's the point? I don't understand <laughs> yes, why. Yes, right. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So, this unexpected revelation comes to us from one Marie Christine Kerouac, 
who was appointed as the ombudsman for the Archdiocese of Montreal in May of last year. This was part of the Archdiocese's effort to convince courts that they could, too, police themselves. Look, they even hired an independent former judge to craft their new complaint handling process and an independent lawyer to oversee those investigations. And maybe that worked for a minute, but just this month, the judge quit in protest and the lawyer released a public report detailing all the ways that they were actively inhibiting her investigation. Oh, just so much ketchup on the wall right now with pedophiles and pedophile (laughs) helpers. The Catholic Church may as well have a we didn't realize anyone was going to follow up on that child rape promise like catchphrase at this point, right? Just a yeah. standard boilerplate. Now, for obvious reasons, reports of abuse are supposed to be confidential, right? If they're not, the person issuing the complaint could be retaliated against or pressured to recant their testimony or shamed or whatever, right? But according to Kerouac's report, she discovered months ago that a high-ranking clergy member was leaking information about abuse complaints, including the identity of the fucking complainant. And in at least two instances, that same priest, one Roger Dufresne, actively discouraged complainants from contacting her in the first fucking place. And, and she only knows about those two, by the way, because those people ignored him. So who the fuck knows how many times that actually happened? But when she brought 50 pages of emails and evidence of this shit to her superiors, it took them three months to do any goddamn thing. And when they did, they just transferred him to a different duty that still technically had access to all the confidential information. OK, so, yeah, I showed you those 50 pages with the, the evidence. You moved him to a different department that's more appropriate for Pedophiles? Is that what you just said? Did you hear what you just said? <laughs> I mean, to be fair, Heath, all departments within the Catholic Church are appropriate for pedophiles. This lady is the outlier here. Yeah, She's the one really. fucking up their business model. <laughs> really? Now, for her part, Kerouac says she intends to stay on the job despite the obfuscation, and that's commendable. But, like, the whole idea that this kind of shit is being handled by somebody other than Canadian Mariska Hargitay is doomed to begin with. Right. Like when they stand in the way of investigators, they shouldn't be risking embarrassing headlines. They should be risking jail for obstruction of fucking justice. The idea that priests have the moral authority necessary to police themselves is as misguided as the idea that priests have moral authority. Yeah, I I feel like covering up child rape should really be a one strike situation. Yeah, there you go. Everything doesn't have to be baseball. (laughs) Next up in headlines. Kirk Cameron, Anna. What are the guys talking about? It's the newest, the greatest Christian freakout. (laughs) That's right. Kirk Cameron did something. He tried to write a book and it went very, very badly. And that means we have another delightful story about bigots having a consequence and then throwing a tantrum. He wrote a children's book full of biblical nonsense and no doubt a bunch of Christian bigot stuff and a bunch of libraries refused to sponsor an event for him. And now he's whining about it to get attention. So he's whining about getting, getting what, pre-canceled? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. It's okay, Kirk. The library also didn't invite me to read my erotic sea lie friend fiction. So, you know. Sorry, sea lie? Uh, Cecil and Eli. God yeah, damn obviously. it. Yeah, okay. Sorry, I asked. <laughs> so Cameron's publisher is called Brave books, go fuck yourself. And (laughs) they did an interview with Fox News to cry about the cancel culture. According to their tale of woe, they reached out to 50 different public libraries and a a bunch of those libraries said no. In response, Cameron and Brave Books pointed out that these libraries are willing to host drag queen story hours and LGBTQ friendly events. And the libraries were like, yes, yes. Correct. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And we are rejecting you because those first things are good and you are bad. So we're rejecting (laughs) you. So that's the latest version of the persecution narrative. Christians are facing consequences for being bad just generally in the universe. And that's the persecution. Yeah. Kirk, dude, make it black, buddy. You're willing to support a Black Lives Matter march, but not a Black Lives Don't Matter march. Do do you hear it now? (laughs) Now do you hear it? Kirk in a KKK uniform just sadly walking away from the library. <laughs> I like that he was like, well, we should have both drag queens and bigots and let the kids decide. Oh, sorry. What's that? Oh, all the children 100% chose not me in advance. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, beans. Wow. Cancel. I'm canceled. Stupid this is bullshit. Stupid time dimension. This is anti-bad persecution. That's what they're going for. And here's the official statement of grievances from Trent Talbot 
the founder and CEO of Brave Books, go fuck yourself. He told Fox News Digital, quote, it's devastating to discover that many of our publicly funded libraries have now become indoctrination centers that refuse to allow biblical wisdom to be taught to our children. The woke left understands that morality is instilled by the age of 10, and they want their own morality to win, not the morality that the Bible teaches. I'm sorry. I just can't get over the fact that they're attacking libraries. Yeah. Libra in five years, we're going to be reporting on Christian puppy shredding protests, and we're still going to get emails about how we're too mean about religion. <laughs> right. Also, again, yes to the thing that the idiot said. Yep. The woke left morality is good and the Bible morality is bad. Yes, we want good to win and bad to lose. We do want that. Yes, we do. And just the record, the request from Kirk Cameron was to sponsor his book reading event. Right. And advertise the event on the library website and provide staffing for the event. Public libraries are under no obligation to do that stuff. He was able to rent a space in these libraries to host his own reading. He chose not to do that. He was being blocked and silenced and canceled none amount. He could have just done his own thing. <laughs> he just wasn't being enthusiastically supported and sponsored in his ignorance and bigotry by the libraries. That's all that happened. Well, right. Yeah, because the whole fucking point was to get turned down. Right. They don't actually want to read books to kids in libraries. They hate reading books and kids in libraries. Right. They just they don't <laughs> want us to have it. Yeah. So Kirk Cameron, I know you're listening. Here's what you got to do. Big fan. Here's what you got to do. So wipe away those tears. Show me that smile again. Don't waste another minute on your crying. Or don't, you know what? Or don't. Keep crying. I don't care. And if the book sales aren't working, I will personally pay, I mean, just a shocking amount of money on Cameo for a new video of you ugly crying every week. Like a shocking <laughs> amount. I don't have a lot of money, but I'll find it somehow. Just hit me up. And also, if you can make it to New York by Saturday night at 7 p.m., Instead of us talking about your movie, we'll make our entire live show just two hours of avant-garde you crying. Yes, we will. <laughs> and we'll pay even more. Yes, we will, baby. Yes. Please come to New York. We'll sponsor it. You can read your children's book. I can't control what the audience will do to said <laughs> book. <laughs> but you can try to read it. Did you see Elon Musk at the Dave Chappelle show, Kirk? <laughs> it's going to go great. Trust us. <laughs> and finally tonight. In Make America Great Again news, U.S. leaders gathered in D.C. last Thursday to discuss the rights of non-religious people around the world. The event, which was hosted by American atheists, drew together politicians, bureaucrats, and reporters to highlight international threats to the rights of the non-religious. Uh, attendees included California Congressman and co-founder of the Congressional Free Thought Caucus, Jared Huffman, U.S. Ambassador-at-Large Rashad Hussein with the Office of International Religious Freedom, and Frederick Davey with the U.S. Commission of International Religious Freedom. And no, we weren't invited despite Eli's promise to wear thematic attire. You got, you have to invite us to stop. Well, I'm not your mistress, Jeff Blackwell. You have to invite, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna come anyways. I'm gonna come anyways. So the event was occasioned by the release of the 11th Annual Freedom of Thought Report by Humanist International. Back in 2012, they released this behemoth survey that looked at every country in the world and graded them in terms of the rights of non-believers in categories like the yeah, Constitution and government, education and children's rights, society and culture, etc. And every year they've updated it, highlighting every country where the grades have changed since the previous report, as well as a, like a list of places where they expect there might be changes in the near future. This year's watch list, by the way, includes once again, the United States of America, where the blurb specifically names both Donald Trump and Clarence Thomas while summarizing the threats non-religious Americans face. Yeah, I get it. I mean, those two are definitely not Christian. I mean, one married a foreigner. Uh, the other is in a miscegenated marriage. And th they're both big threats to, to them th themselves in that sense. Well, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Non -religious the the non-religious that I'm worried about. But yeah. Now, full disclosure here, I haven't actually read the report. I normally do at least peruse them. But, but this one came out right as we were ramping up for a live show and a holiday break. So I haven't had the time to do more than skim it. That being said, I highly recommend you take a look at it. This year's report is just under 100 pages. It's very readable, and it's great information to have if you're the type of person who cares enough about the rights of atheists to say, listen to atheist podcasts. I'll have it linked in the show notes. Ha! Who doesn't listen to the oral arguments now? No illusions. Well, it's still you. Yeah, yeah it's still me. 
And now that I've assigned homework, I guess it's time to close out the headlines for the night. Heath, Eli, thanks as always. Jumanji. And when we come back, we'll tell Uncle Frank to go fuck himself. It's time for the part of the show where we insult people, which is, I guess, another way of saying it's time for the part of the show that comes next. But this time we're doing it for charity. That's right. We're knocking out more vulgarity for charity roast this week. And of course, that means it's time to welcome back the Bert and Ernie of podcasting, but, you know, because they seem like they fuck each other. And the angry one is definitely the top Tom and Cecil of the <laughs> Cognitive Dissonance podcast. <laughs> Who's the angry one? <laughs> I know, right? Well, which one of you is on top? We share the top two. <laughs> Our leftist couple portmanteau is Bernie, by the way. You got to announce no, it Bernie yeah, from now on. Yeah. All right. All right. Okay. Answer the question. Which one's on top? <laughs> we already said we share. Whoever's angrier at any given moment. <laughs> right, obviously. I obviously. like to mix it up. Cool. Yeah. It's feats of strength. It's all decided by feats of strength. <laughs> 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 but that's not all. This week, we also brought brains and good looks to balance out the rest of the cast, which is why Andrew Torres and Thomas Smith of the Opening Arguments podcast are here in spite of the fact that they conspired with Hugo Chavez to fake out fundraising us earlier this year. Gentlemen, <laughs> I forgive you. <laughs> oh, no, that's that's big of you. And, you know, we are always happy to help out a, you know, smaller, unheard of show. Okay. From okay. Right. <laughs> Brutal. You know, we also fuck each other. If anybody cares, <laughs> anybody <laughs> cares <laughs> apparently not. We don't. We don't. <laughs> no. And we know you're the top. You guys do side by side. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, there's no mystery in this one. Yeah. yeah. I'm never <laughs> angry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so before we jump in with the mean stuff tonight, we want to take a moment to thank our favorite kind of donors, the ones that ask nothing in return. These fine folks forked over some goddamn it, Eli. Are you <laughs> the fi fine folks <laughs> forked? <laughs> Alliteration is not my strong suit. No. no. Okay, anyway, no. anyway. These people gave us money, so a big thanks to Celeste, Ty, Origin, Henry K., J., Christopher, and Kathy S., and a thanks to Heath's puppet master brother, Joshua A, AJ, Chris B, Matt E, and David N. All right. And also, thank, thank, make... What? What is this? <laughs> hey, Heath, we have to keep it going. We have to keep it interesting. Yeah, yeah look who's changing the format again, huh? But, right? All right. <laughs> thank, thank, make the booty go spank to Zach, <laughs> April Poff, our favorite listener. Ooh, ooh, April Awesome. Allison, Sarah M, Nick K, Eric D, and Mike B. And of course, there are plenty more people to thank, but now we had Heath say something silly. So that, I mean, that's, that was the point of this whole exercise. Cool. <laughs> and at that point, we could dive in with Thomas. Greg would like a roast of his Aunt Cynthia. Oh boy. So yes, I'm glad uh, you brought me here. It is my specialty indeed to uh, tell people their family members suck and they shouldn't talk to them ever again. That is <laughs> what I'm best at. Now, uh, usually this is like kind of because I'm way too pro cut off the family. Like it's when someone's mom says they don't like their outfit and I'm like, oh, so you never talk to her again, right? It's just out of your life. <laughs> but in this case, in this case, gentlemen, I got to say, holy shit. If what this guy is describing is accurate, his wife's aunt basically human trafficked her as a child oh, for slave labor. What is and happening? kicked her out when she got sick. I, it's what's in the document that you fuck your sim. I don't know. <laughs> she sounds like a literal sociopath. Do you roast Jeffrey Dahmer? Are you like, <laughs> yeah, that guy doesn't even have any basic human empathy and he's a monster in every way. And his glasses are dumb. I don't know. Like you don't roast. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, his glasses were dumb. They were. <laughs> So I'm sorry, I have to turn this into a roast of your wife because in the document it says she's not willing to talk to the aunt again unless she's, quote, willing to have a long and difficult conversation. I'm sorry, folks. You all care about your families way too fucking much. Especially <laughs> a fucking aunt. You don't have long and difficult conversations with your human trafficker. You take legal action <laughs> against them. What are you talking, an aunt? That's not even a mom or a dad or a brother. <laughs> what are you talking about? Willing to have a long, I'm, we need to have a long, difficult conversation about how you human trafficked me. What? Yeah. Just don't talk to her ever again and sue her. This is classic <laughs> Thomas overreacting to human trafficking. <laughs> <laughs> this is Matreon all over again. <laughs> he shows up at the this house. This is what Thanksgiving was made for, a long conversation like this, okay? That's what yeah. Thanksgiving's made for. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, Andrew, we had quite a few folks donate for you to roast Herschel Walker and his election oh, team. It's going to be a tough one. So with a big thanks to Don A., Jesse K., Mike S., and Jacqueline, have at it. R- roast Herschel Walker's <laughs> election team? I mean, why on earth would I do that? I, I want every Republican <laughs> candidate from now and till the end of time to use the stable geniuses who recruited and ran a candidate so bad that a <laughs> casual conversation about the Underworld franchise sparked off a <laughs> national controversy about their candidate's dementia. Yeah, I, I want the world to never forget the ding-dongs who managed to knock Christine, I'm not a witch, O'Donnell, into <laughs> to second place on the list of most ridiculous Senate candidates ever. Yeah, oh, yeah. a werewolf could beat up a witch, though. That's true. Yeah. That's, 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 true. true. That's, a, that's a fair. That's a fair point. Which witch? And as for Herschel Walker himself, well, maybe, just maybe, if you hadn't rushed for 1,143 times in three years behind an O-line hired out of the local Home Depot parking lot for Donald Trump's New Jersey generals in the USFL, (laughs) maybe you wouldn't have done this to yourself. (laughs) Well done. All right, Cecil, this next one is a request for you. That's right. By name. I don't want your pity, no illusion. <laughs> <laughs> well, Joe and Arnie S. would like you to roast idiots who protest at drag shows. Oh, okay. Ugh. All right. Well, they specifically wanted the one that happened local to us here in Chicago. So Lake of the Hills, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago, Uprising Bakery gets to be the latest target for Illinois Nazis. You see, that private fucking business was hosting a drag show. But all the small government twats vandalized their store and accused the owner of grooming kids while they simultaneously tithed 10% of their income to the world's largest pedophile ring, churches. Aren't you the same people who all Christmas sing about how virginal their God's child bride was? (laughs) And some of you don't even know the lyrics of Silent Night and think she was somehow both round and young as well as a virgin. (laughs) Mind blown. Hey, idiots. Mind blown. (laughs) Here's the thing, man. It's a fucking drag brunch. It's people eating souffle and watch someone dress like Ethel Merman sing, everything's coming up roses. (laughs) The only reason you start spewing Spewing hate speech out of your bigot spigot is because your pee-pee starts acting real strange when you think about people in drag <laughs> and your tiny reptile brain whose entire flow chart of actions result in either fight or fuck is leaning deeply toward fuck right now. <laughs> and here's the thing, a, a, a word of warning. Any protesters up there, don't get an arm's length of the performer because even in five-inch spike heels and eyelashes as big as your fist, they're going to snatch that mullet off your head like a bad weave without fucking up their makeup. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Noah, this next one's for you. Julie would like a roast of her brother, Jeffrey. Yeah. No. So apparently I roasted his moon landing denialism back in 2019. And since then, he's become an anti-vaxxer. What? And a fucking flat earther. No. <laughs> a flat earther. Yeah. Little did we know moon landing denialism represented Jeffrey's intellectual high watermark, given that he accepted <laughs> the existence of the moon way back then. <laughs> Jesus. But I'll take I'll make a deal with you, Jeffrey. Let's let's put our worldviews to the test. If you agree to huff some of that fake COVID with your unvaccinated lungs, I'll jump off the edge of the earth. Last man standing's <laughs> worldview wins. Also, also, dude, your beard would look out of place anywhere but a goddamn playing card. Get rid of that shit. <laughs> and Heath, you're up next. Big Dad Wolf would like you to roast white male patriarchy. All right. Okay, so Here's the email we got from Big Dad Wolf. He said, I'd like to have a roast of the white male patriarchy, which has enabled me to play life on easy mode. It took me an embarrassingly long time to realize I wasn't all that smart or hardworking, but rather just benefiting from being a tall white male. This may also apply to one or more members of the PIAT team. (laughs) Well done, bro. Well, actually, actually, Big Dad Wolf... (laughs) Uh, That is nothing like my experience. You were trying to talk about me, but it's nothing like my experience. I knew right away that I'm not that smart or hardworking. So (laughs) (laughs) also, if it wasn't for the white male patriarchy, we wouldn't be doing this fundraiser right here, right now to help prevent poverty caused by the late stage capitalism of the white male patriarchy. (laughs) (laughs) Think about who would podcast 
Big Dad Wolf, <laughs> who, podcast, <laughs> who has the perfect combination of confidence and mediocrity if you take away the white male patriarchy, <laughs> idiot. <laughs> Just think it through. Also, maybe shut the fuck up and stop ruining the deal, you fucking narc. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're doing great. All right. I've been looking forward to this one for a minute here. Eli, Ashley would like a roasty impression of opening arguments. Oh, oh okay. Oh. Uh, no problem. All right. So imagine, podcast listener, you've just finished clicking on the most clickbaity episode title possible, <laughs> right? Something like, How Democrats Will Win the Senate and You'll Get a Puppy. Because if OA was a YouTube channel, your thumbnails would be of Andrew's cleavage at this point. <laughs> and as the obscure <laughs> Simpsons quotes of the opening music fade, you hear this. All right, here we fucking go again, I guess. Oh, God, I fucking hate this. I hate you. Andrew, how are you? I'm fantastic, <laughs> Thomas. In fact, I made this lovely optimism souffle for today's show. Oh, did you, Andrew? Because I shat in it. I shat directly <laughs> into the center of it. How do you like that? I don't. Did you wipe with my 34 pages of show notes? You're damn right I did. And while Andrew collects his one weird trick for Stormy Daniels to levitate the Mueller report over Joe Manchin, we're going to kick it over to Ace Associate Morgan Stringer, a 30-year-old woman who talks like a middle schooler who isn't taking her parents' divorce well. But first, <laughs> ad copy read like an Al-Qaeda hostage with food poisoning. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well done, sir. Boy, that's got to be rough if you're an Al-Qaeda hostage and you get food poisoning. <laughs> right? <laughs> Fuck. Also, I think Morgan handled her parents' divorce rather well. Well, there you go. <laughs> Good correction. Yeah. All right. Tom, give us a roast of Jasmine's dad, Morris. Uh, you know, it is, it is one sad truth that many men leave their wives when their wives get sick. So in that sense, Morris isn't special. In fact, there is no sense in which Morris is special. Nothing about him is unique or exciting. And honestly, Jasmine, the best thing he could possibly do is to just exit your lives. If there's any possible weaker and more pathetic thing to do than to bail on your loved ones when they are vulnerable and in need, I literally can't imagine it. But Jasmine, if that's who Morris is, you can't change him. You can't reach into the hollow, cavernous place inside of him where his heart should be and do anything to fix it. So when guys like this leave, the other truth is that everyone is better off. The weight of dealing with being sick will actually be lessened by not having to carry both cancers at the same time. Ooh. Well done, sir. <laughs> oh, well done, so everyone. Mean. I love it. Every time. <laughs> Every time Tom does a roast, I feel like the Muppets at the end of Muppet Christmas Carol, where they're like, hey, this part's too scary. We're just going to bail out. We'll see you at the end of the movie. Every time Tom does a roast, an angel has its wings chopped off with a chainsaw. <laughs> yeah, it's the greatest. And shown to it. And shown yeah. to it. Oh, look yeah. at these wings. <laughs> Fucking look at them. <laughs> you used to be beautiful. <laughs> well done, sir. And that's the buzzer. So either Tom's roast just took up the last of our space on Lipson, or it's time for another <laughs> spightening round. All right. The category is political ploys. I'm going to give each of you an obscure one-off political request that we got for Vulgarity for Charity. And I'd like you to create a new campaign slogan based on their physical appearance. Are you ready? Ooh, ooh. Yeah. <laughs> yes. All right. Andrew, L.A. County Sheriff Alex Villanueva. Ooh, Alex Villanueva, because if you can't defund the police, maybe a teeny tiny little guy is close enough. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Eli, Tom Emmer. Ooh, uh, Tom Emmer. What if Henry Rollins ate his own conscience? <laughs> <laughs> All right, he's not enough obscure one, so you get Chuck Grassley. Oh, excellent. Okay, Chuck Grassley. I can't remember if I turned off the oven after my hate crime. But uh, <laughs> Pepperidge Farm remembers. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and Thomas, what is Austin Scott's new slogan? Ooh, elect me. You know I won't waste any time on bathroom breaks considering I look like I haven't taken a shit since 1994. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, do you have a, a catchphrase for Caleb Collier of Spokane, Washington? Caleb Collier. You'll forget my face, but you'll never forget my smile. It will haunt the dreams of your children for generations. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Noah, one for you. Ken Calvert. 
Okay, all right. Ken Calvert, I probably wasn't really just talking to that sex worker that cops caught me with in 1993, but look at me. If anyone ever paid a sex worker to just talk to them, it would be... All right, this is too long. This is too long. Ken Calvert, are you going to finish that? (laughs) All right, and right back at you, Cecil, why don't you finish off the spitting round with a roast for former Governor Paul LePage. So I just want to say Paula Page, governor of Maine, he was such a shitty candidate that after he won twice, the whole state just agreed to rank choice voting. Like everyone in Maine felt so ripped off, they scrapped the whole old system. Like fuck that. All right, so for a slogan, let's go with Paula Page, why settle for just one neck roll? I'm the rank choice. <laughs> Well done, huh? All right, before we close out things for tonight, it's time for us to thank a few of our high-dollar donors. These are folks who show that the big bucks to guarantee themselves a spot in this fund, and we're going to take a philosophical start. Andrew and Heath, Mark would like a roast of deontological ethics. Uh, Fuck yeah, great pick. Yeah, <laughs> deontological ethics, the fourth worst excuse for why your dick is halfway in a loaf of sourdough on the security <laughs> cameras at the local stop and shop <laughs> because of duty. But what if the only way to save it? Let me stop you right there, okay? <laughs> Deontologists have literally never proposed anything that would actually save that orphan. No, they just need weird philosophical what ifs to indulge their sexual kinks, and I'll have none of it. Look, if you want a philosophical reason to indulge your kink, you do it the old fashioned way by claiming to be a utility monster like the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> also, just to be clear, as a utilitarian, I'm the one who saves the orphan by fucking the sourdough. You're not doing shit as a deontologist. You just sit there paralyzed by conflicting duties while I get results in that stop and check. That's what I do. I wake up every day, I brush my teeth, I have my coffee, and I save orphans by fucking bread in public. And then I do it again the next day. Fuck your deontology. You don't do shit. All right. All right. Anyone can have a go at these. Uh, this next one. Nathaniel F. would like a roast of Alaska Governor Mike Dunleavy. And since Ryan H. requested them as well, this is for him too. Mike Dunleavy looks like Chris Pratt had the top of his head removed and replaced with a flesh-colored smokestack. <laughs> <laughs> and now he's embarrassed, so he hangs a Davy Crockett hat up there to hide it, but it doesn't. It is right. not at all. <laughs> it is a shockingly tall head. Right? right. Like I, I, I wanted to go after his appalling stance on climate change or immigration, but his head is so fucking tall. I just I I pictured him like gazing into the distorted reflection in like the car window, daydreaming of a rounder head, wishing Herschel Walker had been there to round it off for him or something. <laughs> but Cecil, your smokestack theory would at least explain why he abolished Alaska's climate change task force. He's looking out for the smokestacks. He's worried they'd be coming after him. <laughs> yeah. Mike Dunleavy's hairline looks like it's trying to distance itself from him in public, like Andrew does with me when I start to encourage the assassination of public officials. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, Eli, if it makes you feel any better, I would way rather see sit on your head and listen to you give out Neil Gorsuch's home address than be Mike Dunleavy's hairline. That's all right. Okay, I don't think we should be making fun of physical appearances on the show. It's it. We're talking about hair, people's hairline. If you can't control your hairline, I'm, his ideas are bad. That's what I have to say about him. His ideas are bad. Is this funny? Am I doing roast correctly? Is this awesome? <laughs> I will say Mike Dunleavy has a face that only a mother could love, but since he appears to have been produced by some kind of asexual budding from a humanoid maggot, I guess he's out of luck <laughs> there as well. <laughs> All right. So next up, Sam D gave us three thousand and seventy dollars or one billion NFTs for us to <laughs> roast. <laughs> Sam Bankman Fried, the ex CEO of FTX, just got arrested in the Bahamas. Like, oh, nice. Just oh, got arrested. Good. Yeah. Awesome. Sam once bragged to a reporter that he never reads books and he never would, which is too bad because I hear those are real time killers in prison, Sam. Right? Gonna, yes. <laughs> give him a shot, buddy. I'm sorry, though, but how the hell is the guy who fried a banking alternative's name spelled Bankman Fried? <laughs> <laughs> is this fucking Dr. Strangelove? 
Kyle down. <laughs> Kyle down, please. <laughs> he, hero protagonist. <laughs> <laughs> It looks like someone tried to store a Furby on the blockchain and then lost the directions on how it went back together. <laughs> <laughs> Sam is the last desperate test of our universal simulation to see if there's anybody that we won't give a billion dollars to rather than just learn some fucking Python, right? <laughs> and we failed yet again. So at this point, they're just weeping outside the computer we're all in the dream of and Sam, <laughs> Sam is the reason. <laughs> Bang Fried had a net worth of $10 billion in October of this year. And now <laughs> it's approximately zero, maybe less. <laughs> also worth noting, he offered to help Elon Musk by Twitter. And that <laughs> literally would have been a much better investment than FTX. <laughs> <laughs> literally. Let that sink in. Like your new <laughs> net worth. Oh, asshole. Oh, oh. All right. All right, Heath. But yeah, I get it. Bankman Fried was at one time worth billions, but only in exactly the same way that my net worth can be increased by buying up all the Monopoly games from Goodwill and then flashing my sick new bankroll. <laughs> <laughs> he was also like Biden's biggest donor. It's hard. It's tricky. Uh, it's a tricky yeah. one. Yeah. He was did some good stuff. Look, this might be more of a roast of crypto in general, but like I love how your whole thing, your entire cryptocurrency thing, you're just in love with and you think it's the greatest thing in the world. The whole thing went to shit and crashed harder than anything I've ever seen crash ever. And the regular economy, you know, where the money is, was like, we don't care. This is yeah. literally does not affect us in any way. <laughs> like, trillions of dollars of fake currency was erased. And the real economy is like, what? That's not, we don't, that's nothing. That doesn't affect anything. I'm going to go buy milk with my American dollars. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Tom's just throwing his monopoly money in the dumpster, checking his <laughs> stocks to see when they, when he can buy on the dip. Why <laughs> isn't this working? <laughs> All right, so let's take things back to the personal here for a roast of Karen's brother, Jim. Okay, okay. We have to talk about this. Jim voted for the first time ever to elect Donald Trump in 2016. Yeah. <laughs> That's like your first word being a slur. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, and, and he's a boomer. Jesus. Right, so it's, it's, it's as though he just came down from the mountaintop Zarathustra style <laughs> and the first thing he said was a slur. <laughs> wow, yeah. Jim looks like he walked to school uphill both ways in the snow only to learn that everyone else was taking the bus and they just didn't bother to tell him. <laughs> <laughs> Jim looks like the villain in a movie where the protagonist is trying to give fresh baked cookies to the homeless. <laughs> <laughs> And last, but diametrically opposed to least, Tom, our top donor of the fundraiser, Jennifer G, would like $20,000 worth of roast for Supernatural star Jared Padalecki. And Eli, you can join in as well. Woo! <laughs> Who? Jared. Jared, what the fuck, man? Listen, listen. You're on Supernatural. Nothing you do is important. Supernatural <laughs> is like super not important. It's not, but it's important that you give people the space to imagine ways that you are important. And if one of the ways they want to do that is to imagine a relationship that a not even real character is in with another not even real character, then man, you just smile and you give them the fucking space to do that because that's what matters. It matters that people feel like you are giving them that room to imagine and to wonder and to be fucking titillated. And if you're so incredibly threatened by people's imaginations, your masculinity is gossamer fragile. And that's sad, man. It really is fucking sad. If you can't even let strangers have fantasies about you without feeling the need to insist that you'd rather they imagine you as smooth as a Ken doll down there, <laughs> then indeed the biggest fucking eunuch in the room will always be you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes. Jared, listen to me. You were born with the genetics of Hercules and the IQ of a statue of him. Just let him <laughs> say your character's gay, man. You're on a show where you and your brother hunt devil, angel, werewolf, vampires for killing your mom. I think it's possible your character might put a penis in his mouth. <laughs> also, I just, I hated you on Gilmore Girls. Granted, that's 
just because you were on the show Gilmore Girls, but it needed to be said. It needed to be <laughs> said. <laughs> dare you? Who was he on Gilmore Girls? He's a uh, handsome. Oh. <laughs> so, wait, wait, but that's not all. See, when you shell out the big bucks like Jennifer did, we go full cast in force no matter what. So while it's not about Jared Padalecki directly, our very own Anna Bosnick has composed a song that we know he's going to hate. So without further ado, hit it, Anna. I've been asked to write a song about Supernatural, but I've never watched the show. I never saw a single episode, but a lot of people like it, I know. Yeah, there was just one thing to do. I asked for help, and a friend came through. So this is what I wrote for you. Supernatural. As described to me by my 30-something queer best friend who was on Tumblr a lot way back when it was popular. Oh, it's uh, about the two guys that want to fuck each other. They're also brothers and they want to fuck each other. Just two straight guys that want to fuck each other and a bunch of other guys that want to fuck each other. There's also an angel who wants to fuck a brother and probably a demon who wants to fuck the other. But the Winchester boys just want to fuck one another. And that's what the show's about. Wincest. There's a monster of the week and the world's about to end and every girl's killed off before she can be any more than friends. And the actors swear this isn't what the writer's room intends. But ask any fan and they'll make it comprehend that it's a classic tale of best friends to lovers. A will they, won't they confess to each other that they're head over heels in love with each other. According to at least 80% of Tumblr and 15% thinks that's gross cause they're brothers and they'll have a happy ending with their angel demon lovers and the other 5% breaks them up with each other and ships them with Sherlock and who? Amazing job, Anna, and thank you once again for making it seem like the rest of us just really phoned this shit in. Speaking of which, Tom, Cecil, Thomas, <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, <laughs> thanks so much for helping out, guys. Yeah, brutal, of course. but honest. <laughs> brutal, but honest. You guys sing a song now. Right? You go. <laughs> and remember, first, there Steve. are still plenty more roasts to come, so if you haven't heard I yours have... yet, be sure to stay tuned here <laughs> and over on Cognitive Dissonance for even more vulgarity for charity. There's no business like show business. Like show business. I know. Cecil's been hanging out with his cats. <laughs> Cecil, cheers. Cheers. Before we engage the parking break today, I want to remind everybody to come and see me in Orlando, Florida on the weekend of March 11th at Free Flow. We had a great time there last year, but it would have been even better if you had been there. Be sure to check the show notes for links to pick up your tickets. Anyway, that's all the blasphemy we've got for you tonight, but we'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be on the lookout for a brand new episode of our sister show, The Skeptic Ride, debuting at 7 Eastern on Monday, an even new episode of our sister show's Hot Friend God Awful Movies, debuting at 7 Eastern on Tuesday, and an even new episode of our half-sister show, Citation Needed, debuting at noon Eastern on Wednesday. Obviously, I'd get demoted if I neglected to thank Heath Enright for being the heart of the podcast, Lucinda Lusions for being the brain of the operations, Eli Bosnick for being the spleen, which also serves a number of very important functions. I want to thank Tom and Cecil one more time for all the amazing work that they do to make vulgarity for charity such a success. I need to thank Thomas and Andrew for being so generous with their time this week. I need to thank the incredibly talented Anna Bosnick for another amazing contribution. I also want to thank Sean and Janice for providing this week's Farnsworth quote. And not that we don't appreciate the apology for Lauren Boebert, but I don't think we're ready to forgive yet. We still need time. But most of all, of course, I want to thank this week's most dashing diploids, Michael Dallin, Z, Sammy Sos, That, Cody, Vince, Jordan, Kyle, and Russell. Michael Dallin and Z, who are so hot a fever would cool them down. Sammy Coden and Vince, who are so tough bulls brag about being as strong as them. And Jordan, Kyle, and Russell, who are so bright they put a glare on the TV. Together, these nine nifty non-believers nudged our net worths nearer to normal this week by giving us money. Your money isn't the only thing on our Christmas list this year, but it is on there. And if you'd like to make our Christmas wishes come true, you can make a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash scathingatheist, whereby you'll earn early access to an extended ad-free version of every episode. Or you can make a one-time donation by clicking on the donate button on the right side of the homepage at scathingatheist.com. And if you'd like to help, but you're not gonna, then don't. That's fine. Sounds like you've got some, like, you shit to work out anyway. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Tim Robertson handles our social media, and our audio engineer is Martin Clark. We're also one of the music that we used in this episode, which was used with permission. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, you find all the content info on the content page at scathingalias.com.
No. <clears throat> Chuck, I talked to Tough to do two in a row like that. I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready. Okay. Uh, nope. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2022. All rights reserved.